For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Now, um, moving on from here, I just <clears throat> recently, we were talking about this before we went live, I just recently read through your chapter in Evolution's Achilles Heels on Origin of Life and Abiogenesis. Now this, this chapter, personally, it, it absolutely blew my mind as to how thoroughly you refuted abiogenesis in a naturalistic origin of life scenario, or I should say scenarios. Uh, can you yeah, touch yeah. on some of the major problems, for example, the massive chicken and egg problems that abound when it comes to abiogenesis? And of course, Dr. Sarfati, and anything else that comes to your mind on this topic? Well, okay, well, see, I'm a chemist. I know something about chemical synthesis. I think most of the biologists don't really know that much about it, to be honest. I think Dawkins is, is pretty clueless about chemistry. And the thing is, uh, it's not a case of going an argument from in ignorance. It's actually an argument from what I do know about chemistry and information theory and the complexity of living creatures. I mean, as you may have seen in the Achilles heel video, for instance, if, if anyone wanted to make a protein from amino acids, the last thing you'd want in the reaction mixture is water, because water will drive the reaction the other way, because you have amino acids combined to form proteins and they uh, eject a molecule of water. So it's called condensation polymerization. That's a fancy term. So the last thing you want is to have water there because it drives the reverse reaction. So no, no synthetic chemist is going to have water if he's, if he's trying to make a protein. And yet they want to tell me that life began in some sort of primordial ocean, and oceans normally have water, I thought. So now that's a big problem. And then you've got things like the, the amazing information storage system. So even the simplest living cell, it's called the mycoplasma, has about 500 letters of DNA information. But these letters, they code for proteins, but you can't actually decode this, uh, the information and DNA unless you have a lot of decoding machinery. But the problem is that DNA codes for its own decoding machinery. It has the instructions to build its own decoding machinery. machinery. So which came first, the, the machinery? Well, how do you get that without the instructions? Or do the instructions come first? But you can't read those instructions unless you have machinery. So you have to have everything working together right from the start. Otherwise, life could not exist in the first place. It couldn't even get started. And if you can't get started, then Darwinian evolution is dead on the, in the water. It's like runners, uh, they're lining up for a race, they all die on the starting block. That's what we got here. There's no life to, to start even talking about natural selection and mutation because the life is not even there in the first place. And another thing is they realize that the uh, accuracy of a translation of the of the decoding machines must be incredibly accurate. I mean, Manfred Eigen, who was a Nobel Chemistry Prize winner, he worked out that if you have a genome of so many of n number of letters, the the decoding must be at least one over n in accuracy. So if you have a hundred thousand letters, the decoding machine must only allow one mistake in every hundred thousand. Otherwise you get error catastrophe and it, and it grinds to a halt. So right from the start, the decoding machines must be incredibly accurate. So this goes back to Genesis 1. God said he created everything very good. And now we have modern science showing that things had to start very good. They had to start basically perfect. And what we're seeing is degeneration. See, it could not build up from imperfection to perfection, because without an almost perfect decoding system, the, the thing would come, come crashing to a halt really quickly. I mean, um, imperfect decoding machine, okay? You've got 
instructions being read to make the next decoding machine, but you got mistakes because it's not a very good reading machine. So you're going to introduce mistakes into the next generation of machines, which will do a worse job of, of decoding, which will introduce more mistakes in the next generation, and therefore do an even worse job of decoding. So you're going to get the whole thing crashing to a halt really quickly, unless it started off basically perfect. Nice. Well, um, the na naturalistic evolutionists attempt to defend the abiogenesis by reporting that RNA world is a plausible scenario for natural. Mm -hmm. um, is this actually plausible? And if not, could you go over some of the major problems? Oh, well, RNA world does seem to be the uh, the, the go to thing, but it's interesting. There's a, a, a Dr. Harold Barnhart, who's a German working in New Zealand. He wrote a paper called "Why RNA World Hypothesis Is the Worst Theory of Origin of Life." except for all the others. <laughs> so, I mean, he admits there's huge problems with the RNA world, but everything else is even worse. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, one thing is, if they, see, what they, they tell you is that RNA can sometimes act as an enzyme. So what they're trying to do is combine the, the coding and the machinery into one molecule. But what they don't tell you is that it can either do one or the other. See, if it's trying to code for instruction, it has to be loose so it can be the strand can be pulled apart and you can reproduce those instructions. But to be an enzyme, it has to be, be already combined up with each other. You see, so you can't do both. It's either combined or it's not. Got it. So, so, so the RNA has to make up its mind. Is it going to be an enzyme or is it going to be a coding uh, molecule? It can't be both. I see. And then RNA is an incredibly unstable molecule because I think uh, you might remember 2015 Nobel Prize for Chemistry awarded to Thomas Lindahl and two others because Thomas Lindahl discovered that DNA breaks down incredibly quickly. It's just very vulnerable to ordinary chemistry. So he realized that living things must have amazing repair machines to undo the chemical damage that you you suffer every day. Every day, each one of your cells has about a million DNA letters damaged, but you have chemical machines to repair them. Otherwise, you'd be a mutated mess really quickly. You, you couldn't survive. So this is why, why the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2015 for the discovery of instability of DNA and the needed chemical repair machines. But RNA is about 100 times less stable than DNA. Wow. So therefore, the idea of RNA arising in a primordial soup when it's a very unstable molecule, it doesn't make any chemical sense. In fact, even the building blocks are very unstable. I mean, ribose, adenine. I mean, for instance, even Stanley Miller, you may have heard him, the, the great yeah. grandfather of the of the origin of life um, experiments. He, he, he did experiments to show that uh, ribose disintegrates in boiling water and even in ordinary water. So it, it looks like right from the start, based on what you're saying, Dr. Sarfati, they would have a major issue trying to even get the building blocks for RNA. The building blocks, as you said, are incredibly unstable. Mm -hmm. Well, for instance, they talk about ribose being formed by formaldehyde and alkaline solution. But what they have to do is they have to stop the reaction at a certain precise time. Otherwise, uh, there's a reaction called the Kanitsaro reaction. When you have alkali and sugar, it'll actually decompose them. So you have to have someone stopping the reaction before the stuff starts to break down again. And that's, I think, uh, Dr. James Tour has talked about this. He's a, a leading synthetic chemist in the world. And he talks about how um, any real synthesis, you have to control the time. You must stop it at the right time. You must have the reactions of the right sequence. You must control the pH, which is acidity or alkalinity. Uh, you have to control the temperature. All these things have to be controlled. Otherwise, things break down. Primordial soup wouldn't have an organic chemist doing all those controls. Right, right. Good point. And aren't a lot of these RNA world experiments highly controlled, highly manipulated, highly contrived? Well, you see, what they're doing, they, they see, they, what they have to do is trying to work out how the first self-reproducing organism arose. So what they're not allowed to use is artificial reproduction scenarios. Like they talk about evolving RNA sequences, but what they're doing is they're artificially reproducing RNA in a way that wouldn't happen in nature to try to explain how the first self-reproducing RNA arose. But they're using reproduction to try to do that, and they haven't even succeeded, by the way. But even their methods don't make sense because they're using what they have to explain to produce the using reproductive machinery to explain how reproduction came about in the first place. Uh, how about the uh, carbohydrate first hypothesis? 
Carbohydrate first. Well, what do you mean? See, the thing is, um, carbohydrates, that's just sugars. As, you, as I said, sugars are unstable. I mean, that's the thing. They make them in a formaldehyde called the Butlerov for um, foremost reaction. But you have to stop that at the right place to stop these sugars from decomposing. I mean, that's the thing. Our ribose instability is very well, well known. So, I mean, carbohydrate first doesn't really make any sense. And also carbohydrates, they neither code nor do any work. Right. You see the energy molecules, sometimes structural molecules like cellulose. But you see, uh, in living things, you have the nucleic acids, DNA is the information storage system, and proteins do most of the chemical um, work. Most of the machinery is proteins, information, DNA. I'm not sure how carbohydrates are going to fit into that. Right. Good point, uh, Dr. Sarfati. What about somebody who, I guess we got a question here from the audience, I'll throw, somebody who would say, uh, if proteins can last for some time in the water, it's then possible to have them participate in the process. Why is that a problem? Well, okay, you see, but you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, we've got billions of years to perform chemical evolution, but with billions of years, you've got time for the proteins to degrade. So the thing is, time is the enemy, and uh, not the friend. Because you, the longer you leave it, the more the 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 the, the, the more longer time you have for the reaction mixture to go, get to equilibrium, which is away from proteins, away from the polymers, and back to the monomers. And the thing is, how do you get the proteins in the first place? Because you can't just um, oh, I've got some amino acids from the Miller experiment, which are very dilute and very contaminated. Uh, let's take that to the next stage and see if we can get proteins out of it. They never can do that. Because you know what they do? They say, well, we've found a trace of glycine or alanine from the Miller-type gas-sparking experiment. So let's go to a chemical company and buy pure alanine, which is left-handed. Um, let's activate and see if we can get protein, uh, some polypeptides happening next. They can't do that. But think this is the sort of step they do. Every time they they emit the idea you've got to um, pure, isolate and purify the material and then put it into a con carefully controlled reaction to do the next step and the next step and the next step. It just it doesn't work that way. No one's going to spark gases and then try and expect proteins. You'll never find proteins in the Miller type experiment. Well, like, I like Sorry. And, 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 no, that, that's okay. Great answer, Dr. Sarfati. I love the way you put it, uh, that real chemistry goes in the opposite direction than would be required by the origin uh, or any origin of life scenario that says life came from non-living chemicals because uh, it doesn't water it tends to drive the reaction in the opposite or i should say the wrong direction if you like yes and yeah, the thing is things like uh left-handed versus right-handed which we cover like uh, all the proteins and living things are left-handed you know my left hand and my right hand they're mirror images but you can't map them i can't fit this right hand into a left-handed glove it won't work and you see the proteins and living and enzymes are all one-handed otherwise the enzyme could not form if you had this mixture of handedness so the problem is a miller experiment um produce an equal number of right and left and there's a, quite a hard problem in chemistry to try to get one from the other so in, in the in the milliuri experiment then dr uh, mm -hmm. Sarfati, I, I still see people use it to this day um did they find any large biomolecules did they find any nucleotides anything of significance well, most of what they found was formic acid, okay? That's, I mean, but they don't want to tell you, well, we've got a new way of making formic acid so we can make new antisting material. That's what it is. So you've got a few traces of the uh, of amino acids, and tweaking it, you can get quite a few different amino acids. But the thing is, uh, in the environment they're formed in, they couldn't do anything more with them. You couldn't just... Um, take that the broth that forms and do anything and try and get protein out of that broth you can never do it because there are too many other things formed that would stop the reaction going any further like well, formic acid would contaminate if you try to to polymerize say alanine or glycine from the miller the formic acid would get into the chain and stop the chain growing you see so you've got the, these very well-known problems uh with all the other stuff that's produced in the miller experiment acting as poison for any further development. They never actually address that.
Well, it, it's a great answer and great points you've made, Dr. Sarfati. Somebody in the chat likes what you said. Time is the enemy of evolution. Uh, well said, Dr. Sarfati. So we constantly hear them saying, well, give us more time. You know, you're, you're not thinking uh, sophisticated like they'll say, you know, give it a million years and eventually we'll get the origin of life. But it's true what you said, right, that uh, more time is no help to them. Well, yeah, because it, 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 time means you're going to get to equilibrium. And then you got to look at what the equilibrium is, and it's all the monomers and not the polymers. Equilibrium is the racemic mixture of equal left and right hand of right hand of things. Um, you, see, you know, there's actually a method. It's called amino acid racemization dating method because they they find that over time, after an animal dies, the amino acids and the proteins will go to an equal mixture of left and right hand, and that's supposed to be a way of working out how long the the thing's been dead. So, so long period of time, you're going to get the racemic mixture back, the equal left and right-handed mixture back. You can get things, proteins broken down. DNA shouldn't last um, even um, a few million years, even if it was frozen. Right, right. And this is actually a little lead into another topic we can cover about how they found DNA in dinosaur bones. Right. Yeah. Which yeah, dated we're... to about ten times the maximum possible survival time of DNA. Yeah, that's um, that's amazing, Dr. Sarfati. You mentioned it a bit earlier uh, in the fact that, well, for one, I've, I've just got so many points written down from what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I like the fact yeah. that it, RNA is more unstable than, than DNA, and DNA is unstable itself. So that seems like a final straw. But uh, the question I want to ask, and I know the audience will enjoy hearing an answer to, the uh, evolutionists, the naturalists, they'll say, well, okay, fine. We don't have an answer for origin of life, chemical evolution, abiogenesis just yet, but that has nothing to do with biological evolution. Um, can you touch on that? Is, is it totally different? Is, it, um, or is that a valid argument that they use? Well, I think it's actually a, an admission of defeat, really, if they try and say that uh, origin of life isn't part of evolution, when for decades uh, the theories were called chemical evolution. There are departments of, of right. universities working on this called chemical evolution. This is what used to be called. Now they're saying, well, it's not evolution at all, it's abiogenesis, but that's actually a bit of historical re um, uh, revisionism. And the point is, when you look at some of the, the, the evolutionary textbooks, I've, I've got examples of a you know, magazine like Scientific American devoted an issue to evolution and started off with the origin of first life from non-living chemicals by chemical evolution. Okay, so they certainly used to regard this as part of the materialistic worldview. You've got to get a, a simple self-reproducing cell before you can even start, start talking about Darwinian evolution. And it's interesting that Anthony Flew, who is the world's leading atheistic philosopher for decades, he was an Oxford guy like, like Richard Dawkins is, and he said that Dawkins and Darwin overlooked that their theory began with something that had reproductive powers. And this is what a real theory of evolution must account for, to get to this being with reproductive powers. And he says that the findings of you know, 50 plus years of DNA research uh, are a very powerful argument to design. It was this idea, the whole problem with chemical evolution. That's what convinced uh, Anthony Flew to become a theist when he was an atheist for decades before then. Right. Yeah, that's uh, another good answer. I like what you said there. It's a, an, an admission of defeat is exactly what it what it is because evolution's dead in the water. You know, naturalistic and evolution and materialism. Well, well, one last um, question, Dr. Sarfati, till we move on to a, a different topic. Uh, you mentioned we were talking about it before we went live. Uh, topo isomerase. Oh yes, yes. Uh, could you touch on that maybe for the audience? I think that would be a good topic. Okay, now the thing is, think of DNA. It, it's it's a double helix. You know, it's like a, a, a long coiled molecule. I mean, some of you who are older might remember when you had landlines with telephone coils, okay? I mean, I'm showing my age a bit, uh, I guess. Um, the point is, it's uh, DNA of each of your, your trillions of cells, it, it, take one of the DNA from one cell. If you line everything up end to end, it would be about two meters long. But it's only a few atoms thick. And you think of coils, they get tangled up very easily. So, in fact, living things all have a detangling enzyme and different types of them called topoisomerases. And one class is called gyrase. Okay, but what it does, it snips the DNA and does a bit of, of rearranging and then splices it together again. 
Mm. See, otherwise, DNA would be tangled up and you couldn't actually decode it because it would get tangled up when you try to decode it. We get tangled up when you try to reproduce it. See, so without these enzymes working in every living thing we have, DNA would be too tangled up to use. So you think of, of what topo summarizes means. It has to, have to do three things. It has to cut, it has to move, it has to splice back together. See, any one of those um, processes would would be would not be good enough. You'd have to have every one of them working together. So, in fact, one class of antibiotics that you might take if you're really quite sick uh, is called the um, fluoroquinoline. Quinolone, is it quinolone antibiotics? And what that does, it stops the topisomerase putting the thing back together again. So the bacterial topisomerase go through the, the DNA, they chop it up, but don't put it back together. So DNA is chopped to smithereens and the bacterium dies. Uh, but then you've got the other chicken and egg type problem is that uh, the instructions to build so up by a some rate are coded on the DNA, but you can't read those instructions unless you have topo isomerase in action, making sure <laughs> everything doesn't get tangled up in the process of trying to read it. So you've got the thing that, that the DNA can't work without topo isomerase, but you can't build the topo isomerase without the instructions, which can't be read unless you've got those enzymes already doing their work. Oh, it's it's so bad for them. Chicken and egg problem after chicken and egg problem. Oh, well, then, it goes all the way, yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I, I could talk about this all all day, and I know the audience could could listen to it all day. So I guess um, before we move on to the evidence for a young Earth, young world, Doctor Sarfati, I, I am curious. Given everything that you've said, are researchers, let's say in this field, are they advancing at all in origins of life research? <clears throat> I think they're actually finding more and more problems. Right. I mean, uh, for instance, we didn't know about the motor ATP synthase, which makes the ATP. It's the world's tiniest motor. I didn't know about this 25 years ago when I first started with the ministry. Okay, so that's something which is, a, again, a new thing that's been discovered. I mean, we're finding more and more um, things that make the, the cell far more complicated than we even knew 20 years ago. So the more discoveries we have, the more problems are being found for evolution. Quite the opposite of what you hear in the, in the um, propaganda that science is solving the problem. No, it's actually it's finding more and more roadblocks um, to evolution than we had before. So the more we discover, the worse it gets for them, the more problematic it, it becomes. Oh, well, very um, much, so, especially when it comes to the origin of first life, yes. Yeah, that's amazing, Dr. Sarfati. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to